Greetings, everybody. Welcome, welcome. Thank you all for being here. We're very excited to see such a great turnout uh, for today, which is um, our October AIA Iowa Society um, meeting and lecture. We are thrilled again to have everyone here. You obviously don't have to be in Iowa uh, to be paying attention to this right now. Um, but if you are ever interested in joining uh, the AIA, the Archaeological Institute of America, we would love to have you, especially if you're in Iowa. Um, you can just visit our website, archaeological.org, to sign up and become a member. Um, but today, and in honor of National, International? International Archaeology Day, um, we have the great pleasure of listening to Dr. Maggie Dealer. Um, and so she will be talking to us today about representing race in the ancient Mediterranean. But before I start, um, I would uh, just like to do a few notes. Um, first, you will not be able to unmute yourself only um, at you know the host's abilities will you be unmuted. Um, so if you have a question, please put it into chat and that will send directly to the host. That's the only person that you can chat with as well. Um, so again, just if you have a question for um, Dr. Beeler, please put it in the chat um, or private message Angela Zyskowski in the, um, in the chat and she'll be happy to field questions as we go. Um, all right, so uh, other than that, here we go. So Dr. Maggie Beeler is an adjunct assistant professor in classics at Temple University in Philadelphia. She received her BA and MA from New York University and second MA and PhD from Bryn Mawr. Her dissertation was on uh, seals and sealing practices in the early Bronze Age Greece. And her research interests include social identity, race and ethnicity, and Greek archaeology. She's taught a wide range of courses, including race in the ancient Mediterranean, um, multiculturalism in visual arts, and religion in ancient Greece. Um, and has excavated in sites in mainland Greece, Crete, and the United Arab Emirates. Uh, her talk today is titled Representing Race in the Ancient Mediterranean, and I'll let her take it away. Thank you so much uh, to Angela Ziskowski and to Deb Trustee, to both of you for inviting me and for that lovely introduction. I want to thank also the AIA for hosting this series of talks. It's an honor to be here, especially for International or National uh, Archaeology Day to kick it off. I want to also thank all of you for tuning in from home and to wish you continued good health and safety. So let's get started. The subject of my talk today is representations of race in the visual arts of the ancient Mediterranean. Race is a pervasive feature of American life, whether we experience it directly as racism or indirectly through headlines about the Black Lives Matter movement. But what does race have to do with the people who lived 2000 years ago? So I wanna to start today by giving some background on my engagement with the questions of race in the ancient world, which is through my teaching. Since 2017, I've been teaching a class called Race in the Ancient Mediterranean through the Greek and Roman Classics Department at Temple University here in Philadelphia. Each semester, the class examines how race and ethnicity were conceptualized in the text and art of ancient Greece and Rome. Similar questions were explored in another class I taught last spring in Temple's Art History Department called Multiculturalism in the Visual Arts, Greece, Egypt, and Mesopotamia. Race in the Ancient Mediterranean is a long-standing class at Temple that satisfies the university's race and diversity general education requirements for the core curriculum. I structured the class as an investigation of how ancient ideas of race and social difference more generally impact us today. We explore whether race was a concept that existed in the ancient communities under study. It's in considering the usefulness of our modern concept of race and antiquity that students gain new insights into the power dynamics of race today. 
using race to look at the past is instructive because it helps students understand what's happening in the world around them. I wanna to share today some of what I have learned teaching these classes. I dedicate this, this lecture to students because they unflinchingly confront the tough questions we instructors sometimes studiously avoid. It's been a privilege to meet their challenges and hear their perspectives these last few years. So how did people in the ancient Mediterranean think about race? Before we can address this question, we have to define some terms. I'll start by looking at modern constructions of race and give a little historical background before talking about why it's relevant and important to talk about race in antiquity. I'll then touch briefly on ancient ideas of race from the textual evidence. And then we'll look at some examples of the visual evidence I've selected for comparative purposes with Egyptian and Persian art. The first term we need to define is Mediterranean. We need to situate ourselves geographically in order to understand the high level of connectivity through trade, migration, colonization, and other interregional interactions in the ancient Mediterranean. Because it is these points of contact, these encounters, that provide evidence for how ancients conceptualized social difference. The people who lived around the Mediterranean Sea were connected through maritime routes linking Italy and Spain to the west with the ancient Aegean, the Greek mainland and islands, and Anatolia or modern Turkey, the Levant or modern Syria, Palestine, Israel, and Lebanon to the east, and Egypt and Libya to the south. Overland camel caravan routes linked people in Mesopotamia, modern Iraq, Iran, Jordan, and the Arabian Peninsula with the Mediterranean, as did the Nile for the people of, in Nubia, modern Sudan, and further down into Africa. This was a highly integrated world with a great deal of mobility. The next term we need to define is race because we all think we know what race is, but the tendency to avoid the subject means that we're not always on the same page. So race is an analytical category and not a biological reality. According to the Encyclopedia of Race, Ethnicity and Society, race is a social group distinguished by shared physical attributes and social practices. Physical attributes such as skin color and hair texture are phenotypes resulting from long-term environmental adaptations and not fixed or innate biological characteristics. Furthermore, physical attributes are only one part of how we define race. Social practices or customs like language are used to construct racial categories. Four main concepts characterize race in modern scholarship and I list them here. The first is that it is socially constructed. Race is an identity constructed using symbols that are assigned meaning within a given society. For example, the significance of my white skin here in America is not the same as that would be in other cultures because our society assigns a higher value to that color. Two, that it is partially characterized by physical attributes such as skin color, hair texture, etc. It is important to remember, however, that there is much variation within social groups, racial groups. So these phenotypes are only one criterion for creating racial categories. Three, that race is partially characterized by shared social similarities, history, tradition, language. These are those social practices or customs that are in the definition at the top of the screen. And finally, four, that race is characterized by formation of distinct social groups through self-identification. We self-identify our race. That's why you checked a box for race when you filled out the census this year. Federal agencies like the US Census Bureau collect data on race <clears throat> based on self-identification using five categories, American Indian or Alaska Native, Asian, Black or African American, Native Hawaiian or other Pacific Islander and white. The census specifies that it uses a quote, social definition of race and not an attempt to define race biologically, anthropologically or genetically, end quote. It also specifies that these data are collected for federal programs that make policy decisions, particularly for civil rights. The census 
also collects data on ethnicity, but we only have two options for ethnicity in this country, Hispanic or Latino and non-Hispanic or Latino. Ethnicity is a concept closely related to race and often the two are conflated. Ethnic groups are defined as social groups with shared ancestry and social practices. Ancestry refers to your cultural or national origin. So Latino refers to people from one of the many countries in Latin America. A person's ancestry can be real or fictional like claiming descent from the legendary King Arthur. The social practices or customs used to construct ethnic groups include language, food, music, art, literature, religion. So Hispanic falls under this because it refers to Spanish speakers. Oops. Although there is overlap, race and ethnicity are two distinct classification systems. Both rely on self-identification to group people according to social practices or customs, but whereas racial groups are defined in part by physical attributes, ethnic groups claim common ancestry. The history of our racial categories illustrates why there is still so much confusion about the fact that race is not a fixed biological reality. We turn now to the scientific racism that developed in Europe and America in the 18th and 19th centuries since it gave rise to our modern racial categories that I just outlined. Johann Friedrich Blumenbach was an 18th century German physician who divided the human races into five varieties in his book on the natural variety of mankind in 1775. Blumenbach's categories were based on skull morphology or shape. Although he was a staunch abolitionist who believed in the equality of all mankind, Blumenbach set up a racial hierarchy when he designated the Caucasian type skull originating from the Caucasus mountains region in modern Georgia, Georgia as the quote, most beautiful form of the skull from which the others diverge, end quote. 18th century Dutch anatomist and physician Peter Camper examined facial angles to distinguish among the different varieties of people. He presented his work in two lectures in 1770 that were published posthumously. Camper compared the facial angles of Greek and Roman statues, European, Asian, and Black people, and an orangutan. According to Camper's calculations, Europeans were closest to the classical idea of beauty embodied in the Greek and Roman statues, while Black people were the furthest from it. Like Blumenbach, Camper did not believe in racial hierarchy himself, but his work influenced those who did. 19th century American physician Samuel Morton used craniometry, which equated skull size or cranial capacity to brain size and intelligence. Morton argued enthusiastically for a racial hierarchy on the basis of intellectual, cultural, and moral attainment. Morton examined skulls from across the world and argued in Crania Americana, published in 1839, that white people, quote, in enjoyed, quote, decided and unquestioned superiority over all other nations on earth, end quote. His findings provided the veneer of scientific justification for the existing social order of colonial settler racial slavery. Morton was based in Philadelphia and his skull collection is housed in the Penn Museum, which is right up the road from me. Morton acquired more than a thousand skulls, some of them from enslaved people, including 51 from Cuba, one black woman from North Carolina and one black man from Delaware. The skulls were on display in a private classroom in the museum until this summer when they were placed in storage in response to pressure from students and the public. The museum website relates that it is quote, actively working towards repatriating or reburial of the crania of enslaved individuals within this collection. American physician Josiah Knott used Morton's cranial capacity in types of mankind which he co-published with American Egyptologist George Glidden in 1854. In addition to upholding Morton's racial hierarchy, Nod and Glidden subscribed to polygenism, the belief that races were created separately and unequally. Quote, nations and races like individuals have each an especial destiny. Some are born to rule and others to be ruled. 
no two distinctly marked races can dwell together on equal terms, end quote. A committed slaver himself not argue that enslaved Africans were inferior morally and intellectually and thus best suited to slavery. He used his scholarly training to lend academic legitimacy to racial slavery, which was abolished just a decade later. Charles Darwin dismissed Naughton Glidden's polygenism, arguing that all humans descended and evolved from a common ancestor. Knott and Glidden co-published another book, Indigenous Races of the Earth, in which they argued that Black people were closer to chimpanzees than the classical ideal of a beauty, drawing from Peter Camper's earlier study of facial angles. Greek and Roman sculpture and the Apollo Belvedere specifically represented the European ideal standard of physical beauty because white people saw themselves in it. They assumed that the Greek and Roman bodies monumentalized in white marble were white bodies, like their own. In 2017, University of Iowa professor Sarah Bond challenged the supposed whiteness of the Greek and Roman bodies represented in white marble in an article in the online arts publication, Hyperallergic. Bond argued that the, represent, that the presentation of the statues as bare white marble gives the false impression of Greek, that Greek and Roman people were white, when in reality preserved pigments on some statues evidence polychromy the use of colored paints to decorate the statues. Bond points to the legacy of scientific racism in the continued use of the Apollo Belvedere and the debunked pseudoscience that relied upon it by white supremacist groups like Identity Europa, who use classical statuary as a symbol of white male superiority. These groups attempt to intellectualize their racist ideology by invoking Greek and Roman heritage. This camping campus recruiting poster to the left of your screen is one of several that combine images of white marble sculpture with phrases like our future belongs to us and protect your heritage. Identity Europe also posed for photos outside the reconstruction of the Parthenon in Nashville with a banner that reads European roots, American Greekness. According to the Southern Poverty Law Center, the group has since renamed itself the American Identity Movement. Identity Europa is one of several white supremacist groups that convened at the deadly Charlottesville Unite the Right rally in the summer of 2017, just after Bond published her article. So this is why it's worth looking at race in the ancient Mediterranean. To combat the disinformation of white supremacist groups that seize upon the classical tradition to legitimize their extremist racist views. Here, in fact, we see what a Eurocentric value-laden term classical antiquity is. Classical to whom? Who claims Greek and Roman ancestors, Greeks and Romans as ancestors? The short answer is white people, because we keep teaching the ancient Mediterranean as classical antiquity, privileging it above global history. But were the Greeks and Romans white? A review of the ancient terminology is instructive here. It reveals that there were no words that correspond exactly to our modern definitions of race or ethnicity. The Greek words ethnos, genos, phylon, and laos, and the Latin words genus and natio describe groups in the sense of people, nations, communities, or collectives, none of which correspond to racial groups with shared phenotypes and customs, or ethnic groups with shared ancestry and customs. The word ethnicity is a 20th century invention that adapted the ancient Greek word to a modern context. Thus, like race generally and whiteness specifically, ethnicity is a modern social construct. There were no white people in the ancient Mediterranean because whiteness is a modern invention. Ethnicity does seem to find some correspondence in this off-quoted passage by Herodotus, a fifth century Athenian historian whose history of the Persian Wars includes descriptions of the various people of the ancient Mediterranean and beyond. In this passage, Athenians reassure Spartans that they will not betray them to foreign enemies by appealing to their common Greekness, which he defines in terms of shared kinship, language, religion, and way of life. Quote, it would not be fitting for the Athenians to prove, to prove traitors to the Greeks with whom we are united in sharing the same kinship and language 
together with whom we have established shrines and conduct sacrifices to the gods, and with whom we also share the same mode of life, end quote. The word for kinship that Herodotus uses is homaimos, meaning related by blood, referring to ancestry and not shared physical attributes. Herodotus's checklist for Greekness then more closely resembles our definition of ethnicity. Many scholars prefer to use the word ethnicity to examine issues of social difference in antiquity because it is a more neutral framework than race, with the result that discussions of race have been largely suppressed. More recent scholarship centers race in these discussions in order to interrogate the power dynamics at play in the interpretation and presentation of ancient ideas of social difference. Again, a review of the ancient terminology, this time for skin color, is instructive. Greeks and Romans recognized differences in skin color among the diverse peoples of the ancient world. They described Africans as black, ater in Latin, Melanes in Greek, and European barbarians such as Germans and Gauls as white, candidi, or pelidi. Greeks and Romans described themselves as albos or lefkos, which 19th century scholars translated as white. More recent work suggests that these words for the Mediterranean somatic norm, albos and lefkos, be translated not as white, but as pale brown, midway between the whiteness of the Europeans to the north and the blackness of the Africans to the south. The scholarly consensus based on the textual evidence is that Greeks and Romans were not white in the modern sense, despite the best efforts of 19th century scholars to use antiquity as a source to legitimize scientific racism. There were no white people in antiquity because white was never a neutral category. Race is a ranking system. It was never about skin color. That's why our modern definition of white is not appropriate for the German and Gaelic barbarians and slaves in the ancient Mediterranean who are at the bottom and not top of the racial hierarchy. So while ancient people clearly recognized physical difference, there were no racial hierarchies like we contend with today. Greeks and Romans absolutely thought themselves superior to all others, but it was not because of their skin color. Greeks and Romans argued that they were superior to all other people, rather, because of their favorable environmental conditions. Ancient authors like Hippocrates, Aristotle, and Vitruvius argued that European Germans and Gauls were strong but stupid because their environment was cold and rugged, whereas Asians were soft and weak because their environment was mild. They related the environment to the customs people developed to adapt to it, especially political organization. So Germans and Gauls were aggressively unable to organize effectively, and Asians were meekly subjected by empires like the Persians, whose recent loss to the Greeks seemed to prove their environmental theories. These same authors attributed the dark skin of Africans, Ethiopians and Egyptians and others, to the hot African sun, despite attempts to define Egyptians as white by Knot and Glidden in the 19th century. Environment and customs were therefore central to Greek and Roman conceptualizations of social difference, more so than physical attributes, which they saw as resulting from environmental conditions. Again, this aligns more closely with our idea of ethnicity than race. Turning now to the visual evidence, let's examine a class of artifacts that is often cited in discussions of race in ancient Greece. This fifth century Attic Janiform cantharus or wine cup shows two figures on each side, an African man and a Greek woman. These two figures were chosen as decorative motifs for the cup because their identities contrasted with the Greek man drinking out of the cup at the symposium, wine drinking parties where elite Greek men showed off their wealth, status and cultural refinement. The African man and Greek woman represent others social identities that stood in diametrical opposition to Greek maleness and so helped to define it. This wine cup served as visual shorthand for otherness in Greek society. Not only skin color, but also gender were thus central to the Greek understanding of social difference. Shelley Haley's important article, Be Not Afraid of the Dark, 
critical race theory and classical studies demonstrates that skin color was just one factor in Roman constructions of social difference in which race, gender, and class intersected. A similar approach can be taken to this Janiform Cantharos. Although some scholars interpret this as a representation of slaves serving wine to the men at the symposium, there is no reason to assume that the African man represented here was a slave, apart from our own modern biases and reliance on outdated commentaries. It's important to emphasize that our racial slavery was not practiced in ancient Greece and Rome. In fact, Europeans who would today be considered white were enslaved in the ancient Mediterranean. In addition, the ivy vine across the woman's hair may suggest that she is a worshiper of Dionysus, a maenad, whose drunken and frenzied revelry would have contrasted with the restraint elite Greek men were supposed to show at the symposium. The maenad here is paired with an African figure to reinforce the distance, metaphorical in her case and geographical in his, between the symposium's civility and her savagery. Whether or not the figures on the Cantharos are slaves as others, they function to help define what Greekness was from the perspective of the cup's owner. This Janiform Cantharos, therefore, comes closest to closing the gap between ancient and modern ideas of race because it distinguishes people based on skin color. But that difference, importantly, is gendered. Gender differences inform representations of skin color elsewhere in Greek art. Attic black figure pottery painters represented male figures with red or black skin and female figures with white skin. This point is well illustrated by this late sixth century black figure attic jug depicting Achilles slay slaying the Amazon queen Penthesilea. Amazons were of course a mythical society of warrior women. Although both figures are fully armored, his skin and black and hers is white, which serves to, show, to draw a sharp gendered distinction between the two figures. Differences in skin color largely disappear in later classical period attic pottery when painters begin to use the red figure technique, which left figural imagery in reserve and painted the background. This fifth century attic red figure jug shows a battle between a Greek and a Persian. The Greek is shown nude, while the Persian is showed in the distinctive costume used for the barbarians, an all over print two piece with pants. Persians were the barbarians par excellence in Greek art following the Persian words, and this would have been a familiar scene. Although their skin color is the same, the Greek is beardless while the Persian has a beard. This physical difference though, is more ethnic than racial because facial hair can be managed through the custom of shaving or not shaving. This attic red figure wine mixing bowl is decorated with an Amazon amici, a battle between Greeks and Amazons. This was another familiar scene in Greek art that gained momentum after the Persian Wars for reasons that become clear in considering the representational conventions for social difference used here. The Amazon warriors to the right are dressed in Persian pants, a visual reference alluding to Amazon Amazonian barbarism and othering both of them. Whereas the early black figure Penthesilea was distinguished by white skin and bare legs, these red figure Amazons are distinguished by their Persian attire, visual shorthand for otherness relative to the nude Greek hero who Athena joins on the battlefield in this scene. In these examples of Athenian vase painting then, representations of social difference are both gendered and align more with our concept of ethnicity than race. Artistic conventions for using different skin colors to represent men and women have a deep prehistory in Greek art that extends back at least to the late Bronze Age societies of Minoan Crete and Mycenaean Greece. Frescoes or wall paintings that decorated Minoan and Mycenaean palaces depicted men with red or brown skin and women with white skin. This point is well illustrated by this grandstand fresco from Knossos, the largest Minoan palace on the island of Crete shown here with the original fragments of the fresco displayed on top of a watercolor reconstruction so you can get a sense of the whole scene. We see a gathering in the palace courtyard with a crowd of largely undifferentiated male figures 
represented only as heads and shoulders against a red background. In the foreground are female figures with white skin and distinctive flounced garments, presumably performing for the crowd and male figures behind them. This gendered convention for representing skin color is used consistently in Minoan frescoes from Knossos. While the ladies in blue to the left have white skin and elaborately styled hair typical of Minoan women, the male figure from the procession fresco to the right has the red skin and long hair that characterize male figures. These frescoes show that skin color was thus a construction of gender and not a racial difference in Minoan art of the late, Greek, of the late Bronze Age. Minoan artists borrowed long established Egyptian artistic conventions, such as this use of different skin colors for male and female figures. These royal portrait, portraits of Rahotep, a fourth dynasty prince and his wife Nofret show the use of different skin colors for male and female figures almost a thousand years before the Minoan frescoes from Knossos were painted. Later Egyptian royal tombs in Thebes depicted Minoans or Mycenaeans among the foreign emissaries bringing tribute to the pharaoh. This is a wall painting from the tomb of Rekmiri, a vizier to Tutmos III and Amenhotep II, both 18th dynasty pharaohs. It depicts a stock scene in Egyptian art, files of tribute bearers bringing exotic gifts to the pharaoh from foreign lands. These scenes included foreigners from both subjugated states and trade partners, which is what the Minoans and Mycenaeans represent. Scenes showing foreign emissaries in Egyptian art expressed a worldview of divine kingship, wherein Pharaoh commands tribute from far-flung lands as an expression of his power. The various groups of people are represented in a way that emphasizes their difference because this exoticness is a feather in Pharaoh's cap. It's a visual expression of the reach of his power. In this example from Rekmiri's tomb, we see superimposed files of people carrying objects and animals from their homelands. Inscriptions identify them as people from Keftu, Nubia, Punt, and Syria. Keftu figures in ancient art are generally interpreted as Magian, Aegean, so Minoan or Mycenaean. They are represented with red skin similar in color to Egyptian figures. <clears throat> they are beardless, their hair long and curly, and they wear short garments or kilts like those depicted in Minoan and Mycenaean art. Keftu figures also carry objects of Minoan and Mycenaean manufacture as tribute. In this watercolor detail of Keftiu figures in Rekmiri's tomb, one figure carries a copper ingot, which is how raw copper was transported for exchange. The ingot I show here to the left for Comparanda was recovered from the late Bronze Age Luberan shipwreck. The pile of Keftiu tribute in Rekmiri's tomb includes a distinctive animal shaped vessel, like this Minoan stone, stone riton in the shape of a lioness head from Knossos. In another 18th dynasty Theban royal tomb, two Keftiu figures bear vafio cups, distinctive cups made by both Minoan and Mycenaean artists. The vafio cup I show here is of Minoan manufacture, but was found in a Mycenaean tomb. In still another 18th dynasty royal Theban tomb, the Keptiu figure to the right is shown carrying a bull's head right on, like this preserved example from Knossos. The Keptiu figure has reddish skin and long hair and wears the short kilt associated with Aegean figures. To, this, to his left, no, to the left of the screen, is a Syrian figure with his son, who is shown with a similar skin color to the Keptiu figure. The Syrian figure, however, has a beard and shorter hair and wears a long white garment with embroidered edges. The Syrian figures on Rekmeria's tomb also wear this distinctive long white garment with embroidered edges and they carry objects of Syrian manufacture. This detail shows two Syrian figures, one bearded with longer hair and the other beardless with short hair. Both have lighter and slightly more yellowish skin color than the Keftiu and the Egyptians, which is a common representational convention for Asiatic people in Egyptian art. 
the figure to the left carries a cannonet jar, like this example from the Aluberan shipwreck. In yet another 18th dynasty royal tomb at Thebes, we see four foreign princes, two Syrian, one Keftiu, and one Libyan. The first figure to the left is bearded with pale yellowish brown skin and wears the distinctive long Syrian garment we've seen in Rekmeri's tomb. The second figure has the same skin color but shorter hair and beard style that we saw on some of the Syrian figures from Rekmeri's tomb, though he wears a short garment. Next, is the Keftiu figure, who is beardless with darker skin and long hair, but wears a sh short Syrian garment rather than the kilt that we would expect to see on a Keftiu. This last figure is Libyan, bearded with light brown skin and has long light colored hair and wears a short garment. This example shows that as a general rule, Egyptians represented Syrians with lighter skin than the Keftiu. Nubians were represented in Egyptian art with a range of skin colors, from dark brown to various shades of dark to light reddish brown. In Rekmeri's tomb, files of Nubians bring exotic animals such as giraffes, baboons, leopards, as well as valuable resources from their homeland, including ivory tusks, ebony, and gold. This detail shows three Nubian figures, each with a slightly different shade of skin color. Each has short hair, and the figure to the right appears to have styled it in waves, which suggests that his hair texture was kinky. Figures from the land of Punt in Rekmeri's tomb are represented with a similar range of dark reddish brown to dark brown skin color as that of the Nubians. Scholars believe Punt was located in the Red Sea by the Horns of Africa near modern Somalia. The land was rich in valuable resources such as gold, frankincense, myrrh, and ebony, and exotic animals like hippos and leopards, giraffes and baboons. Hatshepsut boasted of having traveled to the land of Punt and represented the people on these painted wall reliefs in her mortuary temple. To the right are the king and queen of Punt, both with dark reddish brown skin. Egyptian artists have attempted to represent the queen's robust figure within their rigid representational conventions. The important point here is that Hatshepsut and other Egyptian pharaohs used representations of foreign contacts as a display of power. Lower ranking members of the royal court like Rekmeri decorated their tombs in Thebes with representations of foreign emissaries as an expression of their devotion to the pharaoh. Foreigners were represented elsewhere in Egyptian art as bound and subjugated enemies, using the same physical attributes we have seen in these Theban tomb paintings. In both contexts, their foreignness was emphasized through differentiated skin colors, hairstyles, clothes, and types of gifts, because the more exotic and further flung the land they come from, the longer pharaohs reach and the more powerful Egypt appeared. Similar artistic conventions and motivations were used to represent foreigners in Persian imperial art. In the fifth century BCE, Xerxes decorated the facade of his royal palace at Persepolis, the Apodina, with sculpted reliefs showing foreign emissary foreign representatives from each subject state in the empire. Like Egyptian foreign emissaries, Persian subjects were distinguished by their physical attributes, clothing, and the gifts they bring from their respective homelands. The files of figures carved on the facade of the palace modeled the proper conduct for visitors at the same time that they visually advertised the extent of the empire. Here, we see beardless Ethiopians distinguished by their short pinky hair, Arabs by the camels they lead forth, and Syrians by their clothes and vessel types. Both Persian and Egyptian artists thus expressed a worldview of power and territorial conquest, whether by diplomacy or imperial expansion, using representations of what we would call race. By contrast, Neither in the late Bronze Age Minoan frescoes, nor in Athenian red figure vases, which are roughly contemporary with the Egyptian tomb paintings and the Persian reliefs we just looked at, 
neither of them use skin color or other physical attributes to differentiate among people. It's important to note, however, that Minoan artists use differences in skin color distinguish, to distinguish between men and women within Minoan society and not among foreigners like Egyptian artists. And while Persian artists symbolically and literally carved out their empire and monumentalized its reach to humble visitors at its royal palace, Athenian vase painters making decorated pottery for wealthy clients distinguished Persian from Greek just by their beards and pants. In general then, Greek constructions of social difference in the visual arts do not demonstrate a concern with representations of what we would call race, especially not when they are compared to Egyptian and Persian examples that do. Even the barbarian that they had just defeated was represented in a more gendered than racial way. Remember that Amazons in Persian costume were a fitting allegory because Greeks thought Asians were soft and effeminate as a result of their mild environment. I wanna end my talk by talking about two exceptions to this general rule. This fragmentary Minoan fresco from the House of the Frescoes at Knossos depicts two male figures, one with black skin and the other with reddish brown skin, though both wear the same kilt. Scholars suggest that this is a Nubian soldier serving at the palace and being led by a Minoan captain. Unlike the other frescoes that we have seen then, this shows a foreigner distinguished on the basis of physical difference without any reference to gender. This exception to the general rule, however, only serves to demonstrate how diverse the ancient Mediterranean was already in the late Bronze Age. The other exception is Athenian exceptionalism. The Athenians claimed to be autochthonous or literally indigenous to Arak soil. Afto means self and Kathon means soil. Their mythical ancestor, Rechthonius, was said to have sprung directly from the earth. His birth is represented on this attic red figure water jug, which shows the earth goddess Gaia rising up from the ground line of the composition to deliver the baby Erechthonius to Athena. Plato attributed Athenian superiority to its autochthony. Quote, I begin with their excellence of birth. The origin of their ancestors was not foreign, that origin revealed that their descendants were not immigrants come into this land from elsewhere, but were born from the soil and were living and dwelling truly in their fatherland." End quote. Athenians believed themselves to be genetically superior to other Greeks because of their ancestry, which linked them directly to the land through descent from Erechthonius. Autochthony is thus a genetic theory, but it is more ethnic than racial because it refers to ancestry and not phenotype or skin color. Plato goes on to attribute Athenian democracy to autochthony. Quote, the cause of our form of government lies in our equality of birth. Our natural equality of birth compels us to seek equality in law, end quote. Just as Athenians use the genetic theory of autochthony to explain their supremacy within Greece after the Persian Wars, so the inventors of scientific racism in the 19th century used the genetic theory of white supremacy to justify the existing social order of racial slavery. I submit that the myth of autochthony is an Athenian supremacist narrative that in some ways set the blueprint for white supremacy, evident in the influence of ancient Greece and Rome on its architects, even if modern concepts of race do not align with ancient ideas of social difference. Nevertheless, it is an instructive parallel to draw because power is the common factor. How do people in power define themselves? What ancestral claim, real or fictional, do they use to construct their group identity? How do they define group boundaries? Who gets to decide who is Athenian or barbarian? civilized or savage, white or black. To conclude, in this lecture, I have attempted to demonstrate 
that our modern de definition of race did not align with ancient ideas of social difference because while physical attributes may be our main criterion for, for constructing racial groups, they were less important for ancient classifications. We have seen that race is a modern social construct, an analytical category that was never a neutral term because it was invented by 18th and 19th century scholars to justify an existing social hierarchy in the context of European and American colonization and slavery. These same scholars implicated ancient Greece and Rome in their scientific racism, which was discredited already in its day by Darwin and has since been thoroughly debunked as pseudoscience. Nevertheless, extremist groups still cling to the notion of a white Greece and Rome because they seek to legitimize and intellectualize their racism. We have also seen that although Egyptian and Persian artists represented racial groups distinguished by physical attributes and customs, Greek art from corresponding periods represents difference in skin color in the context of gender difference. It bears repeating that the ancient Mediterranean was not a woke utopia. Fifth century Athens in particular was xenophobic and rigidly patriarchal. That's part of why it appeals to groups like Identity Europa who whitewash ancient history in the service of their extremist ideology. Our racial categories may not be appropriate for describing ancient ideas of difference, but those differences were observed. The important point is that nothing in ancient Greece or Rome resembles the institutionalized racial hierarchies invented by 19th century slavers we still struggle to overcome today. Athenian exceptionalism is a cautionary tale. In 454 BC, Athens assumed control of the treasury of the Delian League, an alliance of Greek city-states who united to guard against the threat of returning Persian forces. Athens, enriched itself with the stolen funds to rebuild the Athenian Acropolis, an overreach that ultimately resulted in the Peloponnesian War in which Sparta defeated Athens. Athens never regained its place atop the hierarchy. It constructed for itself with stolen funds and a myth of genetic superiority, effectively ending their democracy. Surely there's a lesson in there for ours. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Beeler. Um, wonderful, thank you. Um, we do have lots of questions. My dog has decided to join us in these questions as well. Um, so I would like to start with Nick Blackwell. Uh, he had a question. He said, I'm curious to hear Maggie's take on the different color representations um the one red and two white figures for the people on the knossos bull leaping fresco Ooh. do these color differences represent gender or something else mm. nick would ask that question uh so that question is one that i studiously avoided in part because I'm, we're not entirely convinced that that figure, the bull leaping figure, I don't have a foot, um, an image of it here because I was trying not to uh, get into that. We're not entirely sure, here's a Minoan fresco, that the bull leapers who are represented on either side of the bulls, if their white skin is indicating that they are female or um, it may also be indicating that they are priests of a goddess who are then being represented in the guise of a woman in the same way that the, uh, the prince with the plume on his hair, whose name escapes me right now, Prince of the Lilies. Although with the Prince of the Lilies, my understanding is that that figure was reconstructed from maybe several fragments from different figures. It's an amalgam. So that maybe that interpretation doesn't hold as much. But I would say that it's not clear to us, but I would still argue that it's probably a gendered thing. Even if they are male figures, they're probably being represented with white skin to mark them off as special in some way, perhaps as I said, in, in uh, their capacity as priests to the goddess. Uh, I will note also that there's an interesting thing that Minoan art does with gender where the body ideal of neopalatial figures, both male and figure, uh, male and female is the same. 
And so they all have this wasp waist. They, there's this kind of elision also going on. There's interesting gendery things happening in Minoan art. So no, I have not solved that, uh, but I would argue that I think it's still within the realm of a gender thing that's happening. Thank you. I also have always been curious about that one and sometimes wondered if it was something like a stage progression, like a time progression, stage one, stage two, stage three, but then like why would they? Yeah, but in the same image. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Um, but then why the alternating colors? But yes, definitely something to th still think about. Um, from Paul Soleil, um, according to recent work on racism like that of Ibram Kendi, we too frequently confuse culture slash ethnicity with race. How does your working definition of race grapple with this contentious question? I would add that it's, it's not my definition of race. It is the definition that is from the Encyclopedia of Race, Ethnicity and Society. So I don't think that um, it in any way contradicts what Dr. Kendi discusses, which is, important for archaeologists because I touched on it just briefly for too long we've been talking about culture when we're really talking about race and we're talking about archaeological cultures in racial terms and that is something that we need to extract ourselves from doing not only by uh, looking at how people like Sir Arthur Evans were racist and trying to figure out um, what they're doing with their terminology, but also in being more clear in our terms. So I chose these two uh, definitions of race and ethnicity to work with my students because it gives sort of a sense of where the overlap is and also gives you a foothold into the process of why we're so confused about what race really is. So I would say that um, uh, Dr. Kendi and uh, Tanisi Coates, these are people who appear in my classroom with uh, interviews, with the things that they're saying, Toni Morrison talking about race and racism in a lot of different ways. I have studiously avoid talking about racism in this talk because it's a completely separate area, I think, when we're talking about whether or not there was racial or ethnic prejudice in antiquity. I'm not saying that there wasn't. I'm saying that that's a, that's a topic for another time. Thank you. Um, this one from uh, Stephanie Kimmy. Uh, she said, I really like how you establish the differences between the cultural approaches to depiction of other ethnicities. But could you speak to the audiences of these images? Minoan palace versus Egyptian tombs versus attic vase painting that likely ended up in Italy. How does the viewer of these objects play into these choices? Does it matter or not? Yes, it definitely matters. And it's this, it's something to consider in on two scales, the audience for um, who is actually consuming these products. So in the case of Minoan wall paintings, it would be visitors to the palace who like visitors to uh, the per Apadna, the Persian palace want to be overwhelmed with uh, the beauty and the uh, craftsmanship and the might of the state that you're visiting the central place to. And so for the Minoan, um, for the Minoan palaces, I think that it's difficult to say whether they were hosting foreign emissaries in the same way that Neo-Assyrians and Persians were at their palaces. It's, it's, not an, uh, it's not a clean equation. So in terms of who would be seeing these things, if you were not a Minoan, would you understand that you have a white figure who's female and a red figure who's male? Probably if you are aware already of the longer tradition in Egypt of what's happening. Now, the audience for the Tomb paintings, of course, is the dead, right? And so it is for him to express his piety to the gods and his uh, devotion to Pharaoh. For the Attic vase paintings, I touched briefly on the fact that we're, these are wealthy elite men who are consuming them. And so that matters in the context of how difference is being gendered because we have to assume that it's, it's men who's consuming them. In terms of the Italian consumption of these, I think that we're probably talking about the same sort of 
gendered elite. So it's the intersection of class and gender in terms of it's going to be the people who have the money who are being buried with them. It, these, none, none of these rules really hold in every single case, which is why I wanted to end with two exceptions to kind of show you that there are no rules. And that's kind of the point. It was such a diverse place. It was such a diverse and dynamic landscape. And we're talking about multi, multiple continents over multiple millennia. And so the way that they conceptualized race in Athens in a one 100 year period is not representative of the entire, not even Greece, not even Attica probably. And so we have to kind of keep those things in mind. But yes, um, Stephanie, the, the issue of who is looking at these things is of utmost importance, but it also matters how we're reading them with us being the audience and coming with all of this cultural baggage about race. And that's why I kind of force the issue of race so that you're so, so that you're forced to confront the sort of uh, incongruity there. If that answers, I'm sure she'll let me know if that didn't answer the question. No, yeah, that was great. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and we are getting dangerously close to the end of time. So uh, before I biasly selecting the last question, um, I just want to put in another plug for the Archaeological Institute of America. Um, I am putting if you would like to join, if you're not a member, I'm putting that in the chat right now. Uh, you can join there and make sure that you, you know, list which society you want to join as well. We are the Iowa Society for those of you in Iowa. Um, but last question for you, Dr. Beeler, comes from uh, Tashi Treadway. Um, Tashi asks, uh, do you have any tips or readings to look for for teachers to teach Latin or classics that isn't a white narrative? Oh, there are so many. And I really recommend that you start with Rebecca Kennedy's blog, Classics at the Intersections, because it has an entire page dedicated to resources for teaching, videos, um, links to podcasts, uh, every website. It has a nearly exhaustive bibliography. Also, um, the Pharos is specifically against, which is another blog, is specifically um, oriented toward debunking the misappropriation or appropriation or just use um, of white by white supremacists of the classical tradition. So classics at the intersection, Pharos, Eidolon, the blog by Donner Zuckerberg, which is unfortunately uh, nearing its end, but it's still a wonderful resource for your students. I really like using Eidolon because it is scholars who are writing for a popular audience. So often I will assign an Eidolon article by McCoskey or Kennedy next to one of their scholarly articles so that the students also get good with source evaluation and with understanding this issue of audience. So let's see, Eidolon, Classics at the Intersection, and Pharos. Start there. Uh, there are so many. This is a really hot topic. And so you, uh, a quick Google search, Tashi will uh, help you with that. If you have any questions, though, you can email me. I'm happy to help you with that. Excellent. And if you could put your email in the chat, I would greatly appreciate it. Um, for those of you that sent me questions that I did not uh, get to, I apologize greatly, but please feel free to email Dr. Beeler directly. Um, and again, she's putting her email address in the chat right now. Um, our next talk is November 9th. Yes, November 9th at 6 p.m. Uh, Dr. Dan Davis will be talking about um, Byzantine or yeah, Byzantine shipwrecks um, in Rhodes. So um, we look forward to seeing you all there. Thank you again for joining us, everybody, and um, have a wonderful night. Thank you again, Dr. Beeler, for a wonderful, wonderful talk. Thank you. Thank you.